Media Temple sponsors the event. Uh, they provided the pizza and the beer, so everyone put your hands together for Media Temple. <laughs> Media Temple is not actually here in the room, so they're not like monitoring the applause, but it's a symbolic gesture. So, you know, they do they do a lot of cool stuff for us and for like J Court and they like, sponsor these events, which is awesome. Um, so uh, yeah, oh and one I guess one last thing, we are hiring, so we have a section on the website about that. I don't remember the exact URL. Work at work at at the bottom page. <laughs> yeah, something like workat.oku.com, whatever. So if you know someone who's interested or you want to do some kick-ass open source JavaScript, Python stuff, like, apply. Um, so anyways, Tim is going to talk now um, about some cool templating stuff, and uh, so I'll let him get to it, and uh, just know that we got another one scheduled for a month from now, uh, not even a month from now, March 2nd, on required JS and script loading and stuff, so sign up for that. It'll be really awesome. More pizza and beer. Uh, so... Take it away, Tim. Okay, before I get started, I see a lot of people with laptops here. If you put yours away, you may want to bring it back because it's going to be a wild ride. Uh, if you go to this web address right here, it talks to tabdeveloper.com. And actually, you can just get this part. Just talks. I made this beautiful website here. It's, it's very functional. Um, but it has the source for my demos, which will go to the GitHub page where I just pushed all of this concept. But if you click slides, it'll bring you to exactly what I'll be talking about. And you'll notice this button right here, which says turn sync off. It's on by default, but I'll be synchronizing all slides as I present using Node.js. So kind of a fun little tidbit. Anybody's interested. What is the URL? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Talks.tabdeveloper.com. T-A-B developer. Uh, I'll just leave it there. Is that like browser tabs or soda tab? I'm sorry? Is that browser tab or soda tab? Soda tab. <laughs> browser tab. <laughs> no, that's just my initials. <laughs> that's not what you're saying. <laughs> that was all good to me, but I guess not to everyone else. Um, but yeah, so like I mentioned, it's on GitHub, so all the source code. If, if there's some parts that I would like to get into that may we not get into, so just feel free to browse GitHub. Also, I'm not browsing my phone. I'll be using my phone as the control panel for my <coughs> presentation. So, <if> just <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I think anybody has ever done this, so we'll see if this even is a good idea. So basically, what I do is I swipe my finger, and this will adjust the slides. Oh, so, okay. so, uh, yeah, I'm Tim Brandon. I work at Boku. I'm a software engineer. I went to school at RIT in Rochester, New York, graduated in 2009. And uh, yeah, again, I work here. It's fun. Uh, I do client side development with jQuery, but I also am very adamant about progression of JavaScript. So, what you'll see in here is some stuff that's pure JavaScript and Node.js, and some stuff that's jQuery. It's my favorite library. And I do server side development here at Django, and I've been writing some stuff in Python. And I've been focusing my native development with Lua, which is very similar to Python and JavaScript. So if you haven't heard of it, so you can check out. And LLVM is a low level virtual machine, which just makes it very, very fast. So my motivation for this talk, as you can tell, I'm probably very big on speed. So websites are slow, especially on mobile devices. And part of that reason is that you're downloading a lot of resources, you're hitting the server. Every time you make a request with a link or a form, it's pulling a new page. If you're using a single page app, it's a pain in the butt to make it act like a real website. You can't often bookmark URLs, and when you click around with links, you're often updating a hashtag and you're not updating a semantic URL. And if you bookmark and you go back to it again, it just doesn't work correctly. So if you want to do search engine optimization, you're not getting the real page, you're getting a landing page that has some JavaScript and then checks the hashtag and then redirects. Uh, caching, uh, that's an, another primary focus of mine because that, that deals very much with performance, not downloading something you've already downloaded. And one of the big issues currently with servers and caching is that you cache a full page. We don't have any notion of content versus a layout. So if your content changes but your layout stays the same, which most likely it will, why are you redownloading the layout again? So templating really is the only thing that you can use that separates both the layout from your content and allows you to conditionally cache. So I'll be talking about that later on. And 
lastly, I think it's really cool that you can use the same templates in the exact same context objects, your, your data, on the server and the client. I've heard a lot of people talking about this. In theory, it's very easy. And people talk about it, but nobody really shows how you can do it. So what I'm going to go through is the very convoluted and complicated process of actually getting this to work. But what you see is it's, it's kind of cool to actually see it work. Uh, to get started, I'll talk about the terminology and concepts that I'll be using the talk. I may miss a few things, so just raise your hand if you don't understand something I'm talking about. That's perfectly acceptable. And I'll go over the pros and cons of this. There are a lot of cons, but there's also a lot of pros. So, And the availability at the end is just the different templating engines. We're going to be focusing on jQuery templates, but that's not the only one out there. So just want to make sure you guys aware of that. Okay, so the first three template terminology are template, context, and render. These are universal between basically every single template engine. So a template is basically a way that you can enhance your data in some meaningful way. There are placeholders uh, that you would set up in your template that then get mapped to your context object, which is your data. So the easiest way to think about that is context is your data, template is your presentation layer. So, and then render weds the two together and makes magic HTML or whatever. Because your template does not have to be markup. You, that could be script, that could be anything. It's just rendered to the point text and then evaluated at some point. And progressive enhancement is a common term that's used. And in this instance, it means that we're using raw web pages that just have no functionality added from no JavaScript. We're adding JavaScript to them when applicable to enhance them and make them just more pleasant to use. And headers and conditional caching are two huge terms that I'll be using because unfortunately there's no way to cache specific content without using <coughs> additional caching and headers. I'll talk about some HTML5 stuff that almost sounded like it could work, but it doesn't. So these two are important. Headers, if you're not familiar with them, are sent before your web page content. I'll show an example in a second. But you just need to know that they're key value pairs, so you can add whatever you want in there. As long as you don't override something that the server's expecting, that's free for you to put whatever you want. So you can actually send data to the server. And this is how entity tags work. This is built into virtually every major server. The only one that I've encountered that doesn't accept uh, entity tags off the bat are uh, Nginx. But I believe that you can get that working as well, just using something like the rest module. But what entity tags are, and you'll, you'll see they're very easy to implement if you do raw code on the server. Like, they're ridiculously easy. They're basically a unique identifier. So I'm using what's called a CRC. It basically goes through the data and assigns a random representation, that's not random, but the mathematical representation of that data. This tends to be unique towards it. Uh, I, uh, when I start talking about it, there are collisions that can happen, but it's like one in three billion, so I want to say that it's not an issue, so just be aware that you could have a collision, but why not happen? <laughs> Alright, these are what headers look like. The first line is the only one that's not a key value pair, and that just tells you the status code, which in this case 200 OK is also what you see here, 202. 404 is another popular one. Uh, and uh, there you go, you have your, uh, your key value pairs. And this is all invisible to you normally. You can see them. Uh, I can pull up enough browser just real quick because it's kind of important to just how you actually see them. So on this page right here, So this will show you all the request headers which you sent to the server, and then all the headers that come back from the server. And it's interesting to note that entity tags, you sent an e tag to the server, but when the server actually gets it, it's not e tag anymore, it's if none match. So I'll, I'll get into that. But it is interesting to note that what you send may not be what the server actually sees. And that's something that the server determines. Okay. So. Okay. Let's <laughs> back over here again. Uh, template <laughs> example. Just so that you can see what exactly a template is. Okay. Is that header view built into Chromium or is that a plugin? Uh, that's actually Chromium tools. You can shift, uh, control shift I to bring that up. And yeah, it's very, very useful. Can everybody see that? Is that legible? Or actually, one second. And is that viewable to everybody? Okay, so 
the script type here. This is just a convention that jQuery templates has, and this isn't the exact correct type, but this illustrates the point that type is irrelevant as long as it's not JavaScript or anything the browser would misinterpret. So long as it's not something that the browser would interpret as a client-side script, this will not be evaluated. So this right here is just my placeholder. It's a variable that when I said like you would enhance your uh, your data with, I could put anything around it. So I could put like an anchor tag, a h1. And then you have your context here, and this is where I actually have the value for that. And the context can come from anywhere. It can come from a database. You'll see later on that I'm pulling a context record from Twitter and applying it to some templates. So it just needs to be in a JSON format or anything on your server that can actually parse it as a key value. And we have the template getting pulled in right here. It, jQuery templates actually maps one to one to IDs. So I have an ID, hello, or oh, actually, wait, no, I'm just pulling a jQuery. And then applying it into the template, but this is where jQuery templates is special. It will just take a jQuery object, and if it's a template, it will render it with the context. And I'm applying it to the main div, I believe it's main somewhere. Right. Okay. And I'll run that. Oops. Multiple bunch spaces. <coughs> But 
a lot of times scrappers don't need to be stepping out of the bounds. And really what I'm going to be showing is stepping out of the bounds of an average web application. And the last bit, unfortunately, <coughs> is that the techniques don't work in every single browser. So we got to pick and choose with our progressive enhancement. And unfortunately, the two big ones are Firefox 3.6, which is currently stable, and IE8, which is stable, do not support session state. So you have, if you want to use that in these browsers, you have to upgrade to Firefox 4 and IE9. OK, these are the various templating engines that I have found that work in JavaScript. And the results that I have found for whether or not they work on the server. EJS was created by the Jupyter Consulting Group that did JavaScript MVC. It's within JavaScript MVC, and that both has a JavaScript server counterpart and a, obviously, client side. Same with Clojure Templates with Google, which advertises the whole unification of their templating code that can run on the server, as well as the client. jQuery Templates, I put notes in there that's still in beta, because it's still in beta, so you're using beta software when you bring this in. So it may not necessarily be production ready, certainly Probably not battle-tested. Closure templates are battle-tested. They're actually used to power Gmail. Mustache, I have to bring this up because it runs on everything. So if you want a templating engine that will work with your server-side language and JavaScript, Mustache is just, that's it. Uh, Jade is another templating engine that replaced, I believe, Hamel.js. And they have a client-side engine that was running, and it worked, I guess, fairly well enough that they listed it in their GitHub, but recently I put a link in here, pulled it from their GitHub, because Jade does stuff on the server that can't be reproduced on the client side, so they're like, there's no point in actually bringing this in. And the same is with Django. My website, Tab Developer, would be bitchingly fast if it wasn't for the fact that it uses Django templates on the server, and the only implementation is in Dojo for the client, and it's for a .96 release, which is a major version and several minor versions behind. So I wouldn't be able to use a lot of the cool stuff that I have, and I would have to pull in a ton of Dojo dependencies. So jQuery templates is really awesome with Node, because you don't have to do all that stuff. It's just there's an implementation in Node, and there's an implementation on the client side, and you're, you're working. And what I'm going to be calling what I'm talking about is a hybrid experience, because we're using the client side and the server side together in a synergistic uh, harmony. <laughs> if I had to just, you know, use some terms. But, uh, yeah, there's benefits, there's negatives for the client and the server, but when we put them together, they kind of, they work really well. And I'll talk about implementing those features. So the client side. The client side is extremely fast. It can pull things with Ajax, it can cache things beautifully, and it can now alter the browser session state, which is an incredible win for us, because when you're using, and I can actually pull an example of a web, website, and I'm using push state. If you watch the URL up top, I'm going to click into here. This is all using push state, and it changes the URL up top. So I can bookmark this, and presumably the rendering on the server when I go back to this, because I can cancel on this URL. Paste it in, hit enter, and I'm on the page, and it worked. What, what browsers support that? Uh, Push State is currently in Firefox 4, i9, latest WebKit. So Safari, Chrome, Opera actually supports it as well. And you get this great experience because it's lightning quick. It's just fetching what needs to what change. It's not fetching the whole page and then like rendering that small part. It's only taking what it needs, putting it into the page, updating the URL to work like it. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with how Push State works. So yeah, you only fetch what you need with Ajax on the client side, you can alter the URL, and you can render things incredibly fast. It doesn't need to actually send that data to you, it's already there. Now the downsides, you cannot parse advanced templates, and that's something that I've already brought up and I need to stress, because you may try something and find, why doesn't this work? This just ruined my whole implementation, I had this working perfectly on the server, why doesn't it work on the client? You just can't do certain things. And again, it's not available on all browsers. The two things, two elements and events that I can think of on the client side that will move you to another page are forms and anchor tags. So these are the two things that are the most important to hijack. And I've created a hijack.js file, which I'll be showing. And it basically just finds all anchor tags. And I'm ignoring forms for the demo just to make things a little bit easier to understand. 
and yeah, this is progressive enhancement. We, we will look for links that, when push data is available, will be attaching ourselves to the links. When you click them, it'll figure out where you're trying to go, what you're trying to do, fetch the template, the context, and then render it on the links. I think we're near oh, Okay, so the push date. My uh, favorite part of HTML5 right now is the fact that we can change the URL. So this now makes my dream come true. We can render stuff on the server, set it down, use the exact same URL, and render it on the client, render it on the client side. And the way this works is there's a session state. So you can think of it as there's one point in time of the browser. This is where we currently are. There's a replace state that will replace what's currently going on. You can think of it as like just an object and a path that represent it. And both of them are optional. You don't have to have an object that represents your state. And you don't have to have a path that represents your state that you're currently on in a page. They're both optional. But you need one or the other to really make any use of this. And one of the major reasons why you would want to use state is that there's no way to know what URL you just pushed into the state unless you save that in the object. And I'll explain, actually right now, how the push state works so you can see what I'm talking about. That is... Okay. So we have a uh, history object that I'm passing into a... Uh, immediately invoked function closure, whatever we call it, function expression. <laughs> and uh, we have an event here on pop state, which I'll get into. But really what's important is <coughs> push state here. First parameter is an session object, which is, if you're familiar with JavaScript objects, you just key value pair inside. And I have href, which is what I'm actually pushing to the address bar, which I will show you. And text right here is just some text that is inside of these anchor tags, so I can actually change stuff. Now, when you hit back, or when you first visit a page, pop state is triggered. So I check first to see if the state object is on the event, and the state object directly corresponds to this object right down here. And if it doesn't exist, then I know that we haven't pushed anything in, and I just want to make the text be, uh, I'm going to store a copy of the text of the current page. And this is one major limitation of using push state. When you first visit a page, it's just rendering on markup. There's nothing dynamic that you've done. There's no way to, when you get back to this page, know what that state was at that point in time. So you really have to keep take careful note of stuff that you might be changing with push date and save a copy of the very first page that you go to. And I'll, I'll show that when we go into the big example of when all this is put together. But for now, just know that when you first hit a page, if you're using push state, you need to save the initial state. And then, once you have the state, you can start making changes. This is a link that I'm just finding a click to, overriding it, pushing it a state that... And then, the second parameter is title. It's not really used in any browsers. I haven't seen it do anything yet. Um, and then the last one is href. This is what actually makes the magic happen. And if, if the title were, it would be like when you click on like the back and next button, and see the drop down, it would show in there. Okay. But it doesn't, it yeah. doesn't work. Does anything show in there? Like, it's just your current? I think you are out there. We'll take a look. So. Mm -hmm. So we're on current page A, and this is what I have to save. I have to save, oh, we are on page A when we first come to this page. That way, when we actually get back to it, there's something to replace. When I click here, I'm now setting an object, and I, I hope this makes sense, that now I'm doing something dynamic, and I'm, I have something to set into the history push date. And as you can tell, I'm changing the URL at the top there. That's really great. And we have backlog support. Uh, I guess the very last one. But this is very kind of complicated, I guess. It does work in the main example. So if anybody wants to look at that, figure out why that's not working, that'd be cool too. <laughs> you, you, you can tell that that's why this part is kind of complicated. Um, okay, so that's push state, but you can see how you can push something into it by just calling this push state method down there, and that's on the history object, which lies on the global object. 
you pass it uh, just any kind of data that you want to represent for that current point in time. And push state will actually add a new entry into your browser. Replace state will replace the current one. I haven't really seen a use for that yet, but I'm sure there are other uses. So you watch what on pop say triggers when you first go to the page and when somebody hits the back or forward button. Hash chains and local storage are kind of interesting because they both do things not ideally. Hash change, with hash, the server has no concept of it, so you have a hash, and you're using some, Google search does this. So when you search for something in Google, it actually saves your full state in a hash. You can copy it and go back to it. The server doesn't know, the client side does. So the client side has to have JavaScript that picks up that hash and then finds the right information to show to you. And local storage has the opposite problem. It has no idea what's going on in the server. So if you start storing your context objects and your templates in local storage, you have to make a request to the server anyway, figure out what the data is, and then kind of compare it. You might as well just use HTTP's caching that's already built in, which I believe I'm getting to once we get to the server. Great, server side stuff. OK, server side is awesome because any device that implements HTTP and HTML will get the content from it. Doesn't need JavaScript, doesn't need anything like that. So if you have a very pathetic phone that doesn't have any kind of cool functionality, you still get to see something, and you see exactly what you should be seeing. So one thing I want to stress, if you're making a new website, it does not hurt to build your website from the ground up using progressive enhancement, making sure it works without any JavaScript. Functional. You get the right content, and it works. It doesn't have to look great, doesn't have to be pretty, but it, it does what it needs to do. And then from there, you can now enhance it and make it faster and faster. And conditional caching can only happen on server. You need to have a server side. So I'm sorry if you're not a server guru, you can't figure this stuff out. Maybe you can look at my example code and try and get like a demo working, but you, you need to use the server. There's no other way around it. And it provides instant, automatic, semantic URLs. That's really nice. So if someone bookmarks your page and they go back to it, they're getting your page because that's what the server's doing. It's outputting the HTML, the markup, and everything is working. And uh, one thing I've noticed while doing this is it enforces good coding practice. Let's say you want to go to a third-party service. Well, your context object never comes from anywhere but your server, so your server is going out making that request. So let's say Twitter goes down and you're caching all the Twitter requests coming in. If Twitter goes down, you're still going to have your tweets showing. Everything's going to work fine. You're not relying on a third party. You're relying on your server. So it's a great side. The drawbacks are... Without JavaScript, changing pages make a full page refresh every single time. And unless you have small content, you're going to see a noticeable redraw. So I've seen a few pages now where I can't even tell the difference, so that's really great. It's not for everybody to be using these techniques. If you have a small website and everything's working perfect already, maybe you don't need this. Your pages are small and fast enough. My tablet alter is already like under 20, 30 milliseconds for most requests. So the actual the total is like 150 milliseconds below my page. I really don't need to have any more performance benefits. It would be nice, but you won't really notice the difference. Unless you're on a mobile device, and mobile devices may notice some performance improvements. And you can only cache at a server level unless you have a client-side component. So unless you can do AJAX and fetch these separate components that can now be separately cached, you're always pulling down one page from the server. And that's the only thing that can be cached. So if your template changes, the whole thing's coming back down, including your data. Your data changes, the whole thing's coming down, even your template, even though you haven't changed it. So, that's kind of a bummer. And, of course, the server can't implementation hash. And this is one little note that I put. It's interesting to note you can only do conditional caching on the server, and yet, without the client, all you can do is a full page. So you really need both of them, and this is where that whole harmony comes in. It, you just need both of them to make something that works right. Okay, so why no JS? And I only have one word for you, and that is Unicorns. They are all over the place, and Node.js is just fantastic. <laughs> so, I'm using Node.js right now, and I can just control everybody who's watching this right now should have just seen Pornify, and it's distributed. So, Node.js is awesome. It's fast, it can handle a ton of stuff. It's JavaScript. So, everybody here who does jQuery should probably be able to read what I'm writing and not have any kind of confusion. It's not Python, it's not Ruby, it's what you already know. It already has a jQuery templating implementation. So if you're familiar with jQuery templates, if you're getting used to it, and you know how these actually work, it'll be easy for you to look at code that's written in Node.js. 
Setting up the environment is incredibly easy. You just install Node, which is three steps. You actually four steps. You download Node. You run dot slash configure. You type in make. Then you type in make install. Very very simple. There's plenty of instructions online on how to do that. NPM is even easier for those who have trouble with three steps or four steps. It's one step. It's one line of code. You paste in your terminal, hit enter, and it'll install. And then as you can see, the rest of the three that I'm using in my example are all one line installs. The last two are optional, and I would recommend graphing them anyway, just to mess with. Express has been fantastic for me to work with. Uh, it's, I'm using it mainly for routing, but there's a ton of middleware and coolness that you can do with it. And CRC is what I mentioned before. Anyone who's familiar with MD5, it's just a hashing algorithm. In this case, it's just going through the data, and it's running it through some maths, and it comes up at a number of area that represents that graph. And running a basic node app, I believe I have a demo for that. If I don't, I apologize. I believe I have. I did. Okay, fantastic. So basic node. I, I pulled this right off of the node website. I figured this would be easiest for people to be able to see how to actually run the Hello World. So this is the Hello World pulled directly from Node.js. Boom. All right, we're done. Okay, we have a web server that can scale, and it's fantastic. But really, what it's awesome at is it's awesome at saying hello world. So that's what it's out. So fantastic, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, the code conversation. <laughs> the code that we saw is just you know it's a few lines. Create HTTP, create server. Right, headers, and actually uh, Express normalizes a lot of this for us, so it's almost like kickboard in a way. It makes dealing with nodes already easy, implementation even easier. Uh, I'll jump to that later. Okay. So that was the basic coding. So the goals for the server implementation that I'm doing here is that we can fetch templates and context based on a URL. I'm going to go into depth a little bit on using headers to be able to fetch what you want, whether it's context or a template based on a URL. And I'm going to tell you now that that was the worst idea I've ever had. It sounded good in theory, but there are some major problems with it, which I'll get into. Uh, I want to be able to render templates with the context, and I want to be able to cache based on the current version of the data. Okay, so the XFetch header is what I was just talking about. This was some crazy idea that I had. Uh, I don't know what else was going on in my head, but uh, <laughs> I thought this would be awesome to be able to make uh, one of those custom headers and make my own called XFetch, where when I click a link, so let's say it's a link to some arbitrary page in your site that you have a template associated with and a context associated with. When you click it, it would custom set it using jQuery, using the before send in Ajax, so you can set an actual header, and I would just set, okay, well, I'm clicking it, I need to fetch a template and a context. So set, set those in there, and xfetch would just have that being the key, and then the value being whether or not it's a context or a template. And the problem with this is, the way that web browsers cache, they cache based on the full URL. So I'm still making that actual URL request to the server. So if I'm going to page1.html, there's no query string, there's nothing to differentiate it only the headers that are invisible. So the browser was caching the same, only one thing. And there's three versions of that file. There's the full version rendered by the server, there's the, cl uh, the context, and there's the template. So while this sounded great, it was just today while I was going through it, and I'm like, why is nothing sending back to 304? I realized that nothing was working. That's why. It was making a new empty tag for each part of this. And I was all excited when I first came up with this, because I was like, oh wow, so we can implement jQuery, and we'll do some press. And then you realize that there's a problem. But there's also a solution, which also has problems. So but it's definitely a lot better. If you care about caching. If you don't care about caching at all, if you can't, don't care about entity tags, you can still use this approach. And I think I still have, I might not have code for it, so, but it, it's probably in GitHub. If people can. So just a, yep. to, to a question about the XFetch header. The point is, yep. you were actually telling, you were saying the server, like, Hey, I want different content based on and using that and header. URL. To, yeah. yeah, using the same URL, but you were telling the server instead of using a query string, using the header, what content to return. I see. Yeah, I figured that would be easiest because when, when you get to the server, you would then have to parse out what the right URL is. If I'm already parsing the correct URL and having the correct routing in place, it would just be a si simple if statement whether or not this request has this header. But unfortunately, that that, that does not. 
I've seen other custom headers that start with X. Is that just convenient? Yeah, it's like extension, basically. Just like, in my mind, it's, it's probably safe to just use X. It looks cool. It reminds me of like X files and stuff. So. <laughs> but yeah, you can call it whatever. It just, this I think makes minimal risk of like conflicting with something that's already on a server. And like, uh, like I, I mentioned, I wrote my own web server as well. I could make my own headers that my server responds to. And if somebody overrides that, it might get some unintended function. Unintended consequences. So yeah, X is, uh, we, we do the same thing with templating. So in the script tag, X is just a common. Okay, so the other method of caching. Uh, this is one that I have not implemented the bottom part, but I did implement the top part. So the bottom part would be keeping a, an object hash of every URL and then the latest CRC. Node is not like PHP and .NET and all these other things. Node will always run. It is a server. So you can actually keep state within that. You can have somebody who comes to your page and have a list of the hashes and the CRCs that correspond with the absolute latest data. So if somebody comes to your page and they have old content, they're going to be sending back old, old entity tags, and then you can compare those. But what I did instead, uh, I'm still comparing, but I don't have a hash that maintains that state, which I really would like, because I think that would solve a lot of problems. I, I have a route that I fetch. So there's a, one that's now slash fetch, slash template, slash, and then I uh, encode a URI with the full like path to that file. Not the full URL, just the path. And there's slashes in it, so you have to encode that. Lots of problems. Okay, uh, implementing conditional caching. This is now the big one. It's one where I'll start pulling out the the big demo that I've been working on. And if we have time at the very end, I would like to do some kind of live coding with it if possible. We might not. Have time. Okay, so the concept is that every request has a unique ID associated with it. I've talked about that. They're ending tags. We're all with me on that. They come down into the invisible headers that are magical and awesome, and they're key value pairs. And when you make a request, and you don't even have to do this. This is the browser does this. When you use AJAX, it, it will automatically tack on that entity tag that you've already set on your server because it's in the cache. And when you send it, you're now setting an if and unmatched. So that's where you're comparing on the server. You're not going to be comparing uh, an entity tag. And the response will send back an ending tag, and that's what you can manually do. So I'm just going to show that real quickly. If anybody has questions, uh, please please ask. This is going to be Node.js now. Uh, this. I have a cache function. <coughs> so, as I mentioned in my comments, it does not receive the entity tag. It receives the if not match. And, and just so people know, what I'm dealing with in Node here with Express, it normalizes the request and response objects. So you get these, like, this is perfect for a like, presentation because I can just say right now, this is the request, this is the response, and then the content at the end here in this function are just, this will be a template or will be a stringified object in JavaScript, which I'll show where I'm actually calling that to determine whether or not the cache is valid. So we have the entity tag, and I'm pulling in the headers from the request, and now it's getting unmatched, it's not an e-tag. And then <coughs> we want to adequately identify that content. So what I do is, I take the content that's currently on my server, like, so if I make a change, this number's going to be now different. And CRC32 can make a negative number, so I just do absolute on it, so I always have a positive number when I'm going through it. So CRC32, in that sense, no matter what happens, we're always going to want to send that latest entity tag back. I just set it up here. So this is now on the response object, and it's e tag. So that's perfect. And now I'm doing my check. This is the magic right here. So if the entity tag equals the CRC32 that we calculated, well, the browser already has it. So we'll just return false here. The cache has been satisfied. And if it isn't, then sure, we want to send back the latest content to the, per to the peeps. So let's see. This is where one of the functions happens. This is uh, one of the gripes that a lot of labs we get a lot of nesting call things. So process page runs every time I get a URL. And down here, I have my simple if statement checks. So right, right, we can say that I have my cache, my request, my response, and then I have the full render template. This is when the server is sending back the full page rendered on the actual server. So this is the full content. And I'm going to be running that to the cache, and that's going to get its unique ID. And then I'm going to send that rendered template if the cache is not satisfied. If it is, then we send the 304. And it's that easy. It's just response, that's not 304. I think comma, you can send it some other stuff too, but 304 will just give you that status code that you need. 
terminate it, and send it to the client as fast as possible. So is it right to say that the, the, the speed win here just has to do with the amount of stuff that's sent over the wire? I mean, it seems like you still have, the server still has to do all the like database queries or whatever it would need to get the context and all of that stuff. So it's just about you, how many bits are sent. Right, and it, it, when we look into uh, how long it takes to actually calculate one of these CRC32s, we can see it might be to our disadvantage to use this. Uh, if you're doing something like an image, it's best to have something like Nginx or whatever server that you have set up do that. Node running its implementation of CRC32, like a four megabyte file is like, I, I can't remember, it's like 300 milliseconds or something, so it's actually quite a long time. But for a small file, it's down to like a millisecond, so it's hardly noticeable. But yeah, this would be perfect for like a mobile device that really suffers for these assets being sent across yeah. the wire. You can also so, do your caching on the server side. You know, when you're pulling from the database, you could correct. then cache, generate the CRC on the back end, and, and then just clear those caches when the database changes as necessary. So right. you, you could do more caching on the server. If you yeah, you could minimize yeah. this, this risk of the CRC calculated on the fly on every request. So like Ben said, you could actually keep that value. And you could probably do that right in Node with like an object. Just keep that cache right in there. Then you would just check one to one. And that'd be even faster. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so is everybody with me on like what, the, what this thing does and like some of those faults that we just identified? Because this is really like, this is the part that I care the most about. And, and let me show you where the individual parts come. So I have a get object that gets three different things, template, context, and then I have a JSON, which I'll get into later. But template, we read in the file, and the file is based off of the path. Uh, I'll get into this stuff later, too. All we really need to know is, uh, where do I actually my Here we go. Okay, so down at this level, where we are in the fetch. Remember, I mentioned that I had to change my whole approach with next fetch to now using a, a URL. So now I'm fetching a template. And then this right here is kind of like a variable that we can say whatever page it is. And then we fetch that based off of request.params.page. That, that's a one-to-one -one map that a colon, whatever you give it, an express. This is an express, not Node.js. Um, and then when I get the template here, I have that, that jump back up to that function that I was just going through where I thought the cache was. The cache is down here where we actually are in the fetch templates. And this is me sending down the template, running through all that. And then fetch context, context, same thing right here, except I have to stringify it because you don't want to be running a CRC on an actual object in every instance. So that's that. I don't know how long we've been doing so. Okay, so. Okay, so yeah, like I mentioned, it's not for everything. Uh, one millisecond to calculate a four, giga, four kilobyte file. Three milliseconds to calculate a, that's supposed to be a four megabyte file, not a uh, 300 kilobyte file. Uh, and this is something else that I've come up with, which is slightly different than what Ben Allman had brought up, which is CRC and the modified date for the Unix timestamp. Not as accurate, but that's something a lot quicker that you could just CRC, and that increases your chance of collisions. Okay, cache manifest was something that I was going to go into, but just in a sense of time. This is an uh, offline cache, and this is another thing that's great for mobile devices. You'd actually make an offline version of your template and your context object. Uh, if, if I have time, I'll, I'll come back to this. Because this involves editing an uh, Nginx configuration file and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is something else I want to try, was adding GitHub repos to my demo. But instead of all, let's go into the demo and actually show it working so you guys can see templates working on the server and the client, something I've been building up, and I actually haven't written so I've been this whole time. So, <laughs> not just, so we'll, we'll see this one. Right. So part of what I'm going to talk about later is how you can integrate into your own application. And every major web server out there has the ability to, right here, perfect, proxy pass. Make a proxy. So whatever port you're currently on, which I'm going to be running on port, I believe, 8080 on this, I can actually map a new path inside of here, slash whatever. This could be slash in your application, slash node. And then your rest of your application is up here. So if, it doesn't, if nothing else hits in here, you can have your slash node. Or you could even do like a, a subdomain, node dot something. Uh, I won't be getting back into this now since I just explained it, but... This is how you do it in a server configuration. You would just make a separate location. And 
uh, light HTTPD and Nginx, the one, two I'm most familiar with. It's incredibly easy to do this. Apache is a little bit more verbose in my opinion, but it's definitely still possible. And IIS has proxying as well. All these, all these servers have it. If you have a custom backend, you're just you're starting to make this a little bit more complicated on me, and it, you're going to have to figure that out with your own server type. But it should be as easy as this. You set up a proxy. This port right here maps to the Node.js port, which I'll show you in my handler code. At the very bottom, when I run Node, you can see right here, app less than 3,000. And app is express. So if you just take around and express is like getting started, you'll see the code is very simple. It's like you define these routes, app listen, and then you have some code at the top right here. These are like just two lines. And that's really all you need to keep going. So basically why I'm showing you this right here is that you can use Node to serve up all your static files, but I don't recommend that because that's not really what it's for. <coughs> It would, it would, it's a single thread, so when you start serving files, it blocks the processes where it could be doing other logic. So it's good to have a real web server, even though Nginx is also not necessarily single threaded, but it's an invented, invented server. It's going to act like a separate thread because it's not running on the same thread as Node.js. So you can start, you can send everything on this one and you're processing on this one. So it's, it just makes much more sense in my mind. So I'm running it here and I'm having a gzip. And this will actually do all the entity tags for me, which is great. So now. And the attacks will be on all my assets as well. And I have two locations here because I was lazy, but I could just have called this assets and then just have one and then point it to that. So it's nice to have one directory that holds all your assets. Makes this stuff a lot easier. Okay. has like some weird environmental variables so that if you try and just give it the one that's in this tab, it actually thinks it's in where Nginx is installed. So I'm just gonna... Running, but Node is not running right now. So to run that, I have a handler.js. So if you're following along or if you go home and you want to test this out, uh, just get Nginx running, install that with whatever you're using. Sigwin has it built in in Windows. OS 10, use brew install Nginx. And uh, your flavor of Linux, just find your packet manager and you can install that and go online. And then you can just do what I just did right here. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always email me, but it's pretty easy to figure out how to feed it a custom configuration file where you can just copy mine and put it into the default. And then just run node, and now node's running on 3000. So I can actually go to 88 and go for it. Great. So now you can see my demo page that I created. This, this, what we just hit rendered on the server. It rendered both the template and the context together. And when I click Twitter here, GitHub hasn't been implemented in Flickr, hasn't. I was hoping to do that, but I can't do that. But viewing my page. I was warned not to do a live demo on this because they may have issues. So if it does have issues, I apologize. But... Okay, great. So now these are rendered on the client side. <laughs> oh dear. It's over. Okay. So I should so I can get these. This is actually this is a different version of Chromium Dev Tools than what I'm used to. So I'm not. Oh, great. It's just now. If I click on Twitter, you see that we now made two requests, and we got the 304 modified. Awesome. So we didn't actually just download that. This is our 304 that we sent from the server. Here we see entity tag. A beautiful entity tag. And if you read Steve Saunders' book on performance, he has some great with entity tags that he talks about. But, okay, so here's my template. And this is something else I'm going to get into, which is really 
quickly as like what the templates actually look like, since this is what the computer is to see templates. Um, and then the context, which actually, as Twitter's response, built right into here, so this massive thing, which is cache. And which does also allow paging and such, but I have not built that into this example. Um, but yeah, these are all, all my tweets. So if you want to follow me, I'm on T Brain on Twitter. You can see stuff which we can over here. And actually, I, let me know if this is too hard. This is too hard to read. It's just easier to show stuff. Is this visible? It's good? Okay. So I'm storing my pages for simplicity right here in a hash, in a uh, object literal. You would not want to do this. You would probably want to pull in your pages from a data store of some sort, uh, CouchDB, any kind of magical NoSQL that does JSON built in. This is me including all that cool stuff that I told you guys to install, Express, jQuery, uh, templating, JRC. So now that we got all like that complicated stuff out of the way, we can see how like templates get pulled in. So get template, read the file from a path, and I list which template is associated with this particular file right here. You can also write your own logic that, based off of whatever this path is, loads it automatically. Uh, this is just for both, just to make sure that people know what we're talking about. We have an empty object that contains the tweets. So we're fetching the context, and the context is purely just that object right here. This is the context. Now, tweets is empty right now, but we will fill it before we send that back. And JSON is this convoluted function that it's just a pain in the butt to get JSON in. No JS. I really wish they had like a helper function. I'm sure there's some library out there that makes it easier. But as you can see here, I'm creating a client, HTTP uh, client, making a request to some arbitrary host with some arbitrary path. And when I get data, I add the chunks. So this is uh, not like you're used to where you get a full response. You actually get chunks and you have to add it together. And then when the request is done, you get the full one. And this is the full Twitter, and I'm parsing it into an object in JSON. I actually make that request. Twitter. And this runs whenever you've had anything that's related to Twitter. So if you go to slash Twitter, it hits process page. And this is the paging that I started implementing right here. So we start at page zero. If you don't supply it, if you do supply the page, then it would provide that and request a params page. And then this goes to the Twitter function that's up here. And then in order to actually get everything to render properly, I always call the process page function that I wrote. Uh, let's go back to that. Okay, great. So get JSON. This looks a lot nicer now that I extracted all that. So I have api.twitter.com. And then this little long string that just gets a page of my tweets. And I'm just getting the first one. And then I find the context. I augment it, so this is me now sending, setting the tweets specifically from the response object. And this is all callback based, so I'm making a request out to the API, and then once it decides that it's done doing what it's doing and it's ready to give me some data, now I'm calling it here. So we're probably all familiar with these callbacks within jQuery, you provide them for all the events and DOM writing and all that kind of good stuff. And the same thing with Node, Node is like full of these callbacks. So I have my hash here, I'm setting my tweets. Have my uh, page incremented here so I can actually list. It's zero based, so this is me casting this because it's type coercion. Page is actually a string when we're going through the uh, URL matching. I match up, so I had an issue where it was actually making eleven always show up instead of one. Because or I, yeah, it was showing eleven when I was on page one. And it was just kind of like, so, and then we just call callback. You'll notice a lot that I'm using this kind of syntax. I hope. Everybody's familiar with this. It's not necessarily the best way to read stuff. It's not the most readable. But for little things like this, whether or not a callback exists, this just checks to make sure that a callback really exists. This is a truthy value. And if it's true, do this. And another option is using an or here. And then this would say, if this is false, do this. But we want it, if it's true, to do this. So if we have a callback, now we can run it. And this is a fixes a lot of errors where callbacks are optional. So if you don't want to provide a callback, why should you be getting an error? You should just, just, just do nothing. So there's a lot of, a lot of extra code in here too that just makes this app run. And the big one at the bottom is the catch-all. So if you're, you don't have anything custom for a page, you just have a template you need to render, then this is what process page looks like. Thank you.
Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's quick. So you can mess around with that and, like, see what, like, the header tags are. And I was going to do some statistics for, like, payloads and such, but I think it's pretty simple <coughs> that this will make pages just much quicker, faster to refresh, especially on the mobile device. You can test this out on your own mobile device as well. I was actually going to do that. That's in your GitHub account? This is all in the GitHub. What's the repo name? Uh, it's tgranite slash... Like tops. Oh, so it's the slides. The slides yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And with the slides, there's a slides folder and a demo folder. Um, okay, so I'm going to show how to add like GitHub repos into this. And I don't know, I'm kind of feeling a little, I don't know about you guys, but I think we're going to start wrapping this up a little bit. But. Uh, using Node with your existing implementations, I show how some web servers have support for proxying. You can proxy on a, your own custom URL, and then you can start using hijack. Ooh, I did not show hijack.js, and that is a crucial one, because this is what runs on the client to make all of this work. And this is also in my, my code repo. So fetch before had like a pre-send where I set a custom header, and now instead for fetch, I have fetch the type and then encode your right component, the href. And then on success, you run the callback with that data. And that data gets used down here. So I have fetch template, give the href from the link that I'm hijacking. But when I hijack these links, as you can see down here, I'm hijacking every single anchor. So that would mean if you haven't yet implemented it, then stuff would start breaking. But you can make your own custom class and just be like, a dot experimental. And now you have, when somebody clicks that, it's going out to your node server instead. And then you can return that content and just show it up. Uh, it's still riddled with you know, problems. You probably would not want to do this in a production environment, but if you're just messing around with it locally, that might Is that the hijacking the thing that's overriding the click handler? Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. So, yeah. Uh, for the progressive enhancement, your links, if you were to click up and do a full page refresh, this stops it by going to this render function. And then render takes the template in the context. I have a long second just to be there. Um, just so see what I'm also seeing. Okay, so we have to, this is another negative. You have to do a lot of this stuff by hand now. You have to set your own title for the page. You have to set any parts that get rendered by the server need to be done manually. So if you have a section that gets updated and a navigation item gets updated, you're using templates for it. You have to manually update those. You can't replace the whole page with like, you can't have placeholders for nav, and placeholders for section, and then render this whole page and then slap it on. You'll just break horribly. Like, you want to do little pieces, not the entire, entire page. That's just not how it would work. So really figure out what stuff needs to change and keep a consistent layout. Right here, I keep the originals. Uh, I mentioned that when you first go to a page, you have no way of getting those. So these are the three important parts for my demo, the header, the section, and the title. And when I actually replace these on pop state, I'm actually replacing what the current ones are with those, and that's why you see over here I'm using underscores for these. Because they're no longer these are. I'm replacing them. So those objects are not valid. They can probably reassign, but this is worse. Hey, Tim. The only thing I would say with your example is that yeah. I would recommend using event delegation oh, to, yeah. to handle the click events instead of binding them to the A's. Because, because when you replace, you're going to be losing all these events. Yeah, yeah, like, then you don't have to worry about rebinding or anything. You just use delegation, you know, on the body and check whatever, you know, you'd actually look at the, check the class in there or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And what, what that's going to it's like in my example, the links never change. So when we click around, the content that I'm replacing don't have any links in them, so nothing's going to be broken. But I, be I believe in one of the slides, and it may be one that got deleted, but I brought up, yeah, using event delegation or live for any kind of links. Um, let's, let's see what this is all right, so this is the end of the talk right here, where I just bring up some things if you're interested in Googling. Range headers are cool. If you don't have the ability to do any cool server stuff, you can actually request a certain byte range from a file that you know might be constant. You don't have to request a full one. Uh, there was some work with using X pointers with XHTML, where you can get like a selector. And of course, you can pass it whatever you want and write it on the server. So if you pass a selector in as a header, you can have your server render out just that content and send it back to you. And let's say someone doesn't have JavaScript. There's just a little hack you can do with NoScript where it doesn't matter refresh. 
to like a slash HTML, which gave you an HTML version. So, are there any questions? I know that I kind of went fast and there was a lot of material and not all about. Uh, yeah, this is just awesome. <laughs> Yep. Would you consider writing things to local storage so that you can run things entirely offline? You could do that, and I think that's really where the offline storage stuff would come in handy, creating a manifest. If you just look up cache manifest, right. that's where you would just list yeah, your files that you want to save. I think that might be a little bit better than using local storage. Local storage is so promising. You think of all these cool things you can do with it until you realize that it's really not going to do what you want. Yeah, it also has uh, file size limitations. So. But yeah, I hope somebody would like, take a look at this and just see if there's any way they can use it in their own code, maybe mess around with that. I wish I could show the code more, but there's just there's a lot of it, and maybe it's easy for me to understand. It's commented. It's easy for me to understand, but it's a little hard to show this kind of advanced stuff being used. But I hope that it wasn't too confusing. Have you looked at um, Kyle Simpson's, uh, like, his... Um so we'll build here stuff he's been working on. No, like I think or something like that. Or yeah, I think that's chainsaw. I know, like, I yeah, know. It's, it's basically like it's it's basically like a server where you can um, it will make a determination for you to render on as a client in the data rendering or a server that does that. It sounds extremely similar to what you're saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how he knows what the right content do and how he sends it down and make sure that you don't refetch the same stuff over and over again. I'll be interested in with that. Is it on the blog? Yeah, he talks about his blog a lot, but I've never really liked it. So yeah, I, I, I never read it. His so talk like, at JSConf last year, he did a talk in, in, the, in the B, uh, whatever, the small room about this. I was actually in the talk, and it was, he was really talking about it at that point. It's like, hey, this is this awesome thing that I'm thinking about, and I've got some ideas, so I don't know what he's implemented, but he was talking about a lot of this stuff. He didn't talk specifically about caching, but more about server-side, client-side JavaScript templates, you know, JSON, JSON uh, model API kind yeah. of thing. Like, just, I don't know where he went with it, though. But. It, the whole idea is like the middle tier. It was like a, your JavaScript would either, instead of requesting um, like the, the template, the render, the render partial basically switch place, it would it would actually either it would request the template itself, like like the actual jQuery template in raw form of it, and go to your service. Like, right, right. This is actually exactly what this does. Oh, so it's like your context. It yeah. just looked like it was like that URL. Mm -hmm. uh, so templates are right here, and this is what you're actually fetching with that, and this is what it's running the CRC on to get a unique identifier. So when I'm looking at the tweets, it's going through.